Well, it's been wonderful to be with you. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, my time with you. I, I really didn't think there'd be 45 minutes of questions, but man, we, we could go all day, you know? But uh, it's, been, it's been good. So my third talk is, is very different from my first two in the sense that now I, I have a talk on the practical benefits of justification. I mean, my theology, inevitably, there's theology in here, but it's more, um, yeah, it's more a practical, pastoral application of what I've been talking about. So some people think that justification by faith alone is a cold and legal doctrine which doesn't feed our souls or doesn't change our lives. They wonder, I mentioned this in the first talk, how it fits with life in the spirit and the call to live a life pleasing to God. The, when, when people say this, they're, they're, they're focusing on what people do. That's important, isn't it? But, they, but I think they fail to emphasize sufficiently what we think and what, what we feel. Of course, what we do is of major importance, and I, I want to talk about what we do at the end. But I think it's short-sighted to think only of what we do because what we think and what we feel influences what we do because we're not, we're not just machines, are we? We're not just machines that do things. What we think and feel uh, fills the horizon of our lives. We, we often don't do what we should do because of what we're feeling. Our doing, at least often, flows out of our, th out of, out of our thinking and our emotions. So I, I, want to, I want to talk about some practical benefits of justification. I'm not expositing a particular text, uh, but I, I will refer to text quickly as we go. So here are five benefits of justification. First, it, uh, it produces praise, so our souls are filled with joy. Second, it brings assurance. We know God smiles on us. Third, it removes guilt. We know God loves us and accepts us. Fourth, it makes us realistic about our lives. We still struggle with sin. Fifth, it unleashes love. Faith produces love in our hearts for God and others. So, I just go through these one by one. First, justification by faith produces praise. Justification by faith alone means we're right with God by faith and not by our works. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. We're justified by faith instead of by doing the works of the law. Our works can't save us because we're sinners and God demands perfection. Since our, our works don't save us, but our faith saves us, then all the glory goes to God for our salvation. We, we aren't saved because our faith is great, but because our faith is an almighty God who sent his son to atone for our sins. Jo Jonah, as Jonah said, when he was rescued from the great fish, salvation is of the Lord. God has secured our salvation through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, that God redeemed us through the death of Christ and through the blood of Christ. God's anger has been appeased and satisfied. God has uh, been propitiated and our sins have been expiated, wiped away. Since justification is God's work and not ours, since we've done nothing to earn God's favor, we respond, how? In, in praise, right? And many hymns and songs, we talked about Matt Boswell, celebrate this truth. And the most famous of them all, by the great John Newton, Amazing Grace, how sweet. I, 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 that, it's true, isn't it? How sweet. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because that's a very biblical idea, that wretched man that I am, Romans 7, 24. We, uh, um, I, I heard someone sing this recently, and they sang it, uh, 
that saved a soul like me. But uh, I, th I thought that was rather wretched. Didn't you? I mean, to change uh, Newton's word, you know? He did say wretch. So, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, by, but now I see. What will we do for eternity? Will it be boring? Well, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days, what? To sing God's praise than when we first begun. You know, when, when we realize and when we feel right, that God has poured out his amazing grace on us, then, then his grace is amazing and it's stunning to us. Then we're filled with praise and, and, and thanks. And we, and we thank the Lord in that little, very simple song. I, I imagine you sing it here. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. You know, some, some criticize justification by faith alone because they think it leads us to be passive. And that's true if we take grace for granted. But when we're astonished by the wonder of our salvation, then we're full of praise and joy, and then we live different lives. So I, I want to say, how how will you touch other people with your faith? And I think the answer is by being happy in God. If, you, if you're happy in God, I'm not talking about being superficial happiness, right? I'm not talking about kind of a false happiness, but if there's a true joy in God, people, people around you, they'll know it. True joy can't be hidden. True joy in God is contagious. So we had, you know, four kids. They were all grown, grown up now. But I always felt the most important thing for me as a father was that our home was happy. Not, not, not a false kind of happiness, but that there was a joy in our home and a joy in the Lord. And, I've, and I, that, to me, that was just the most important thing because kids, kids know us, right? They know what we really believe. We can say things, but what's in our hearts, it, it, come, it comes out. So, um, and when we, when we really feel that we're right with God, and, and, we, and we know it's based on his grace, then we're filled with joy. What does Paul, uh, Peter say? Inexpressible and full of glory. But if, you, but if someone says, what? Well, you know, that doesn't mean very much. I don't care about that. Well, maybe that kind of person isn't a believer, right? Well, I don't care if I'm right with God. It, 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 that, that raises questions. Of course, of course, I want to say something here. That joy expresses itself differently in different personalities. A, a quiet person, right, has a quiet joy. And an extroverted person's joy manifests itself in a more outgoing way. So don't, don't, confuse joy with having an outgoing or a particular personality. Still, it's really, it's real and genuine joy, isn't it? Um, you know, I think it's fascinating how many people miss this. They, they, they actually don't think about the, the radiance and excitement which fills our lives when we know the gospel. And that joy isn't natural to us. It comes from the gospel. It comes from knowing and experiencing God's free grace. That's why Martin Luther, one of my heroes, said we must relearn the gospel every day. Here, here's what Luther says. I have quite a few quotes from Luther in this talk. Many Christians are tired of hearing justif justification by faith over and over. They think they learned it all long ago. However, they barely understand how important it really is. If it continues to be taught as truth, the Christian church will remain united and pure, free from decay. This truth alone, maybe that's an exaggeration, but this truth alone makes and sustains Christianity. You might hear an immature Christian brag about how well he knows that we receive God's approval through God's kindness and not because of, any, of anything we do to earn it. But if he goes on to say 
that this is easy to put into practice. This is where I think Luther is really brilliant. If he goes on to say, this is easy to put into practice, then have no doubt he doesn't know what he's talking about. I think that's true. Then Luther says, and he probably never will. Well, I don't know about that part, right? We can never learn this truth completely or brag that we understand it fully. Learning this truth is an art. I think that's a beautiful way of expressing it. We will always remain students of it. It will always be our teacher. The people who truly understand that they receive God's approval by faith and put this into practice don't brag that they have fully mastered it. Rather, they think of it as a pleasant taste or aroma that they are always pursuing. These people are astonished that they can't comprehend it as fully as they would like. They hunger and thirst for it. They yearn for it more and more. They never get tired of hearing about this truth. Yes, learning this truth isn't easy. We lapse back into works righteousness very easily. It's second nature for us to have to earn something. Everything in life, almost, is based on works. Our school work, grades, are by works, right? Not by faith. Our job, our parenting. People are always evaluating us. Do we measure up? Maybe you're evaluating me right now, right? God reminds us, though, through justification by faith, that we need him, that we can't make it on our own. There is something so beautiful about free grace so that we seek it out. We should all the time, but especially when we're tired and exhausted and spiritually empty. We're reminded that, we're reminded that our resources don't come from ourselves. So we need to return to this truth repeatedly so that we're full of praise and thanksgiving. Second, a true understanding of justification brings assurance. If salvation is of the Lord, and it is, and we put our trust in Him, then God's grace gives us comfort in our doubts because we know our salvation doesn't rest on us and what we do. Galatians 3.1, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So the devil, I take it, I think that's an refer implicit reference to the devil there. The devil can, so to speak, cast a spell over us. He can wave a wand over us so that we forget about what it means to be right with God. I think that's what was happening with the Galatians. They were forgetting what it means to be right with God. We can forget that our righteousness isn't in ourselves but in Jesus Christ. We can forget about imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Now that sounds like a sterile academic doctrine, but it actually provides comfort in the hardest of times. I mentioned this verse earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that was called that's what we call the great exchange. We, we see it very early in uh, the epistle of Diognetus, chapter 9 as well. But he, what's the great exchange? Uh, he took our sin, right? And we receive what? God's righteousness as we're united with Jesus Christ by faith. We don't have to wonder if we've done enough to be saved. For our job isn't to work for God but to believe in God. God doesn't ask us to achieve, right, but to, but to believe. He doesn't ask us to work for him, but to rest in him. If you ask unbelievers if they will go to heaven, if they're interested in going to heaven, if they believe in heaven, right? But they usually say, I hope so, or I think so, because they've tried hard to be good. <laughs> 
They might have even been baptized and go to church. But when people talk like that, we know what they don't, they don't know the gospel. We are to rest in what God has done for us in Christ. We're to cease striving, to be still, and, and know that God is our salvation. In other words, if we belong to Jesus, we know that Christ is our righteousness. Our, our righteousness doesn't reside in ourselves, but in Christ crucified and risen. You know, as Luther said, we're married, we're married to Christ when we believe. All, all, all that our husband has, we have, because we belong to him. Here, here's what he says in the bondage of the will. Even if I lived and worked to eternity, my conscience would never be assured and certain how much it ought to do to satisfy God. We know that's his story too, don't we? For whatever work might be accomplished, there would always remain an anxious doubt about whether it pleased God or whether he required something more. As the experience of all self-justifiers proves, and as I learned to my bitter cost through so many years, but now, since God has taken salvation out of my hands into his, making it depend on his choice and not mine, and has promised to save me, not by my own work or exertion, but by his grace and mercy, I am assured and certain both that he is faithful and that he will not lie to me. 1 John 5.13 tells us the purpose of John's letter. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So God wants us to have that assurance. That, that assurance, again, is communicated in songs we sing. I, I think of the song, and can it be? No condemnation now I dread. I mean, that's just Romans 8.1, isn't it? Why? Jesus and all in him is mine. That's imputed righteousness, right? No condemnation because I have Jesus. Alive in him, my living head, and here comes in, uh, imputed righteousness again, and, and clothed in righteousness divine. Therefore, very, this is very carefully written, isn't it? Therefore, bold, there's the assurance, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. That, that, how beautifully written that hymn, that verse is. When the great J. Gresham Machen lay dying, in the 1930s he received comfort from the great truth of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Let me remind you of who J. Gresham Machen was, in case you don't know. He founded the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in uh, 19, I think it was 1929. Uh, and, and then he was also a founder, or that might have been earlier, but he founded Westminster Seminary. Maybe that was 1929, but in, the, in that period of time. He was a godly man and wrote many books defending and explaining the faith. It is still worthwhile if you've never read his great book, Christianity and Liberalism. It's a very easy read, and the title tells you all. There's Christianity, and there's liberalism. So it's a, it's a wonderful read. His book on the virgin birth, a very scholarly work, is still worth reading today, and many other things Machen wrote. Anyway, Machen was in his 50s, he was ministering in the Dakotas. He, he got sick. The Dakotas, that's right, I should say, North and South Dakota, right below Canada, way up in the north there where it gets cold in the United States, very cold. Well, he got sick as he was traveling, and uh, it became clear, even though he was in his 50s, that he was going to die. What did Machen think about as he was dying? You know, if we have time before we die, what will you think about? What did Machen think about? Well, Machen thought this, I've done many great things for the Lord. I founded a seminary. I even founded a denomination. I've written many great books. God will be very pleased with me. No, he didn't think of any of those things, right? We know he thought of his sins. He thought of how he had fallen short. When you take stock of your life, when you're alone and quiet, and especially when you're about to die, life takes on a new meaning. I, I, you know, Tim Keller uh, passed away the other day and I was struck. I read many re remembrances of Tim because he had an impact on me as well. 
And uh, he talked about when he got his cancer diagnosis, how everything looked different in his life, right? Mm -hmm. He thought of life differently. But, but Machen, as he was dying, he knew the gospel. He knew the truth that our righteousness isn't in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. So he said, in a very Presbyterian way, thank God, he was writing John Murray, the great New Testament scholar, thank God, he said, for the active obedience of Christ, no hope without it. What, what did he mean by that? The active obedience of Christ. It, what Machen was saying is, thank God my righteousness as I go before to meet God isn't in myself. Thank God that my obedience, that my, my righteousness is in Christ, crucified and risen. Because as Machen thought of himself, he thought, I'm not worthy. But my righteousness is in Jesus. So, so Machen died with, with assurance and comfort. That's very practical, I think, how, what happens when you die. A third consequence of justification by faith alone, it's closely related, to assurance is that we are free from guilt. You all look very happy out there, and I hope you are, but one of the most disabling experiences in life is guilt. Guilt and shame, it can paralyze us in our hours alone instead of being at peace. We can think of our guilt and our shame and our weaknesses. Maybe sometimes, when you are alone, the guilt of your sin starts to overwhelm you. Such reflections, such thoughts, can lead us to despair and even deep depression and great anxiety. Justification by faith alone reminds us that our sins are truly forgiven, that we are clean before God. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And verse 3 says what the law could not do, why not? Because it was weak through the flesh, the human being. God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh of Christ, so Christ took the penalty we deserved. In Luther's day, he was good friends with the Dr. Krauss. Obviously, Dr. Krauss was a physician. He was a very intelligent and gifted man. But tragically, Dr. Krauss ended up committing suicide. And Luther tells us why. Dr. Krauss thought he denied Christ, and he became convinced in his mind that Christ was accusing him at the Father's right hand because of his defection. So Krauss's suicide came from overwhelming feelings of guilt that were that tormented him. Now, I, this is not the point of my talk, but I don't, I don't think it follows from this that Dr. Krauss wasn't saved. I think it was very possible he was. I think some, but that's another question if you want to ask about that. But, but Luther rightly said that such despair, what Krauss was, was the messages Krauss was listening to, that he said, that was, a, that was a lie of the devil. Christ is not a judge or a tempter or an accuser, but here's the gospel, but the reconciler, the mediator, the comforter, the Savior and the throne of grace, if you think Christ, and you belong to God, and if you think Christ is accusing you before the Father, well, that's, that's not the gospel, is it? The gospel teaches you're God's beloved son, you're God's beloved daughter, if you're trusting in God for your salvation. A false gospel says to believers, you're no good, you're a failure, you're condemned before God. But if you're a believer and think you're guilty before God, what does Paul say? Galatians 3, you're listening to the wrong message, right? We need to listen to the right message. We've forgotten the good news that we're saved by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Really, in Dr. Krauss's case, he, why, why did he commit suicide? He, start, he really started thinking about his works, right? 
It's a very tempting thing to do, to begin to rely on ourselves in sometimes in amazingly subtle ways. Charles Wesley reminds us of that right message in his beautiful song, Arise, My Soul, Arise. And Arise, my soul, arise. That reminds us of the Psalms, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul, right? Come on, soul. Bless the Lord. Come on, soul, right? And he's saying, arise, soul. Arise, soul. Shake off your guilty fears. Why? The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Shake off your guilty fears because of what Christ has done. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Why are we free from guilt? Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly speak for me. Forgive him, oh forgive they cry, nor let that ransomed sinner die. I, that, I think that's an incredible, wonderful, beautiful song. Our guilty fears must be shaken off because of the blood of Christ shed for us. Our ransomed souls, they won't die because they've been cleansed by Christ's blood. So we can be, we can be full of joy and confidence because God is now our dear Father. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the law by becoming a curse for us. So, so guilt no longer defiles us. Remember Isaiah 118, which I just taught Isaiah 1, the context of that, the sin of Israel is so great in that uh, and Judah and Jerusalem is so great in that chapter. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. So that's what God says about our sins, right? That they, they are uh, no longer staining and defiling us. Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says, God has thrown our sins into the deepest sea. And I love what Corey Ten Boom, who comes from this country, says about this verse, I got to hear her speak in person before she died when I was in Oregon. I heard her at a retreat when she was in her 80s. But she said, after God throws our sins into the sea, he puts up a sign. You remember what it says? No fishing. No fishing. A beautiful, beautiful statement. And, and I can think of another song that communicates this truth. When Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within. There's another indication of the guilt that can torment us. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. So, you know, the case I'm just making is, look, this is a... Is, is this just an abstract doctrine? No, this, this is a very life-giving doctrine because feelings of guilt can uh, torment and, 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 and destroy us, really. Here's an example in human life. It's an analogy of how love frees us from guilt and how love accepts us as we are. It's illustrated in the life of the great Union general of the Civil War in the United States, which took place 1861 to 1865. I don't pretend you all know that history. He later became the president of the United States. His name was Ulysses S. Grant. But I'm picking up this illustration from a biography written about him because we have a great example here of how a husband should love a wife. And uh, this is a beautiful example, and I think it illustrates the kind of love God has for us in Christ. So Grant, Grant was a nobody uh, before the Civil War. He was basically living almost in poverty and he'd been forgotten, but then he became a general and he became famous. And then, and then, you know, as can happen, he ran for president of the United States. And then suddenly, by 1900, things have changed, but by 1900, he was one of the three or four most Americans who'd ever lived. So anyway, he's becoming very famous, but his wife, Julia, she, she was cross-eyed. And so uh, as, 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 as they got older and Grant became more and more famous, she began to worry, being more and more in the public sphere, what her eyes looked like. That, that, that was, you know, what, what would people think, she said, if the great Ulysses S. Grant has a wife and she's cross-eyed? 
So she thought, I'm so deeply unworthy. So she went to a doctor to see if she could have surgery. But her doctor told her, can't be fixed in that, in that day. You're, you're, you're too old. He said, maybe we could have done it when you were younger, but now you're too old. But this, now I'm quoting from the biography. When Grant found out his wife was trying to change her eyes, he asked why on earth she would consider such a thing. She explained her reasoning, saying, why you are getting to be such a great man, and I'm such a plain little wife. I thought if my eyes were as others are, I might not be so very, very plain, Ulysses, his nickname. Who knows? Grant was horrified. Did I not see you? and fall in love with you with these same eyes, he asked. I like them just as they are. And now remember, you are not to interfere with them. They are mine. And let me tell you, Mrs. Grant, you had better not make any experiments as I might not like you half so well with any other eyes. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful way for a husband to love his wife. I mean, Grant's love for his wife points us, doesn't it, to God's love for us in Jesus. He loves us. I mean, he's changing us, but he loves us as we are. And she was trying, right, to get more love and affection. And he's like, I, I, this, I love you for who you are, my dear wife. Fourth, very briefly, justification by faith is realistic. It fits with the already but not yet character of our salvation. We are new in Christ. We're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but we're not all that we should be. We are like people who've come out of the freezing cold. I lived in the state of Minnesota in the United States for 11 years. Minnesota's right below Canada. I'm not used to, I'm used to Fahrenheit for temperature, so this may not make sense to you. But in Minnesota, for a couple of weeks of the year, it can get 15 to 20 degrees below zero. It can get super, super freezing cold. So we're like people who've come out of the freezing cold, which I often experience in Minnesota. That's the world. And now we come into what is warm, the love of God and his righteousness. But we still feel, right, it takes a while for those cold hands when we come into the warm to get warm. Our hands are warming. We're becoming more like Christ, but they're not completely warm yet. We're still sinners. Faith doesn't transport us immediately into paradise because we still have struggles with sin. Luther rightly says, I've mentioned this twice already, or maybe three times, thus a Christian man is righteous and a sinner at the same time. That paradoxical reality, it keeps us humble, doesn't it? Luther says about the Christian, the Christian really and truly feels that there's sin in him. And then on this account, he is worthy of wrath, the judgment of God, and eternal death. Thus, he is humbled in this life. We're, we're humbled by the continuing presence of sin. I think Luther captures better than any, than any other theologian the, the, the weakness that still bedevils our lives. He says... This is one of my favorite Luther quotes. The words freedom from the wrath of God, freedom from the law, freedom from sin, freedom from death, they're easy to say. But to feel the greatness of that freedom and to apply its results to oneself in a struggle in the agony of conscience and in practice, this is more difficult than anyone can say. I think that is one of the greatest things ever written, to feel it and apply it to yourself. It's one thing to know the doctrine Luther is saying. It's another thing to apply it when you're in agony in your conscience. Beautiful. Living by faith, Luther understood it. He wasn't just an abstract theologian. Living by faith is not easy in this fallen world. We're in a battle between the flesh and the spirit. We sigh and groan and struggle against continuing sin. But we are encouraged. Why? For we realize that our righteousness finally isn't in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ crucified and risen. So, I've talked a lot about our feelings so far, right? Guilt, so forth, assurance. But now I'm going to talk about doing. That's my last point. Fifth, 
Justification by faith unleashes love in our lives, and love leads to doing. So I'm not saying there's no change in what we do. So does justification by faith change the way we live? I've been making the case that we live differently when we think and feel about ourselves differently because of the gospel. When you live with joy and assurance and without guilt, then you'll live a different kind of life. Galatians chapter 5, 6, Paul says, faith expresses itself in love. Faith expresses itself in love. Faith unleashes love in our lives. When we, when we trust God, when we depend upon him for everything, then our lives are marked by, by love. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13, all the commands of the law are summed up in love for neighbor. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Those are just different ways of saying love others. Don't murder them. Don't steal from them. Don't commit adultery. We find in Colossians 3.14 that all the virtues of a godly life are bound together with what? With love. The, the whole Christian life is summarized by Paul in Ephesians 5 verse 2, walk in love. A love that is patterned after Christ's self-giving love for us. When Paul thinks of the supreme duty husbands have for their wives, he calls us what? To love our wives, to cherish our wives, to nourish our wives. The controversy over spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is interspersed with the beautiful and poetic and most practical chapter on love. It's no accident that the fruit of the Spirit begins, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, with love. When Paul talks about food offered to idols in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10, he says, what? Love is more important than knowledge. Well, I mean, I could, I could keep going. Faith, faith, but faith expresses itself in love, so faith is, faith is, faith is what feeds love, so to speak, doesn't it? So, if if we're truly trusting God, how does that work? If we're truly trusting God, we don't steal. Because when we steal, we aren't trusting God to meet our needs, right? If we commit sexual sin, we aren't trusting God with our lives. We're thinking that I, I have to find the way to experience pleasure. We don't trust God to bring what he needs into our lives. If we lie, we aren't trusting God because we believe if we tell the truth, God won't take care of us. Well, I, I could go on and on, right? Sin, but since we're already accepted and loved by God, we don't show love to others so that God will love us. We, we, don't, we don't live a godly life with the motivation that God will then love us and accept us as his children. No, our love is the overflow of God's grace. Since God has accepted us in Christ, we're freed up to love others. God, God, the God of the universe knows everything about us and, and he loves us and uh, he accepts us in Christ. And so our love for others isn't an attempt to prove anything about ourselves to God or to anyone else. So God's grace in Christ forgives us, accepts us, it loves us as we are and we respond in love we love, as 1 John says, because he loved us first. Amen. I'm done.